Welcome to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. This is Father Peter Manga. I did not mention in last week's episode, so allow me this opportunity to reiterate that the primary goal, the purpose, and the hope of the Protestant Reformation was, of course, to reform the church Christ founded, to ensure that all were obeying the will of Christ. Sacred Scripture itself states that Christ's will is unity, that they may be one. We are one family with one Heavenly Father. So, we can say that our disunities come from our own will, not His will. We fervently pray for Christian unity. In fact, I'll continue to use these podcasts as an opportunity to introduce some extraordinarily beautiful prayers straight from the Roman Missal for Masses dedicated to Christian unity. Today, this is podcast number six, The Problem of Sacred Scripture Alone, Sola Scriptura. As with the entire series, this is being offered with great hope and prayer for a full restoration of our previous unity. As a follow-up to last week's podcast regarding the Catholic response to Martin Luther, let's explore more of the challenge posed by Luther's insistence that the ultimate authority for the Church rested with Holy Scripture alone, or what is known as sola scriptura, a maxim and theory, by the way, which is itself not scriptural. This notion holds that Scripture itself interprets Scripture, and that, therefore, it alone is sufficient for defining true doctrine. Martin Luther once wrote, A simple layman armed with Scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Well, any Catholic would say the same today. This statement illustrates the grievances of Protestant thinkers who, in many ways, were reacting to the abuses of practice they saw at the highest levels of the late medieval church. Confronting human corruption in the church might have driven these thinkers to seek out alternative sources of authority, but resulted in a rejection of the church's divine origin, organization, and source of teaching. As pointed out last week, Protestantism was defined from its beginning by division and disagreement. As soon as the test for true doctrine began to be one man's interpretation of Holy Scripture and not the teaching authority of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, more and more splintering of the initial movement occurred while the Catholic Church remained one, purifying herself from within. Just consider the Council of Trent. The nature of earthly authority in the church that Christ established is clearly rooted not only in Holy Scripture, but within earliest tradition, which, of course, came long before there was a canon of Scripture. This historic fact is undeniable. Within the historic and creedal marks of the church just mentioned, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, the first of them is unity. Therein lies the greatest challenge of an idea such as sola scriptura, as I've mentioned in previous podcasts. Certainly, different interpretations of Holy Scripture on the part of individuals have contributed greatly to the ongoing divisions up to today. How many denominations are there today, each claiming authority for itself? These divisions speak directly to the need for authority to guide true teaching and an authority that does not rest with individuals, but with those Christ first empowered, whom we call the vicar of Christ, the Pope, who shares vicariously, and so he's called a vicar, he shares vicariously in the Lord's authority who willed it so. So let's consider the history of the church. Beginning in the early church, doctrinal truth was forged through the apostolic succession of bishops with the great councils of the church, with supreme teaching authority resting with the bishops of Rome, the Pope. Time after time, in those early centuries, in response to dangerous false teachings, it was the authority which Christ granted to his disciples and their successors that righted the church. It cannot, therefore, be that sacred scripture has greater weighted authority than this early sacred tradition, 
since the church existed from the time of Pentecost, long before the first Gospels appeared in anything other than oral tradition. For the apostles and their immediate successors, to refer to the Scripture was to refer to what we call the Old Testament, as that was the Scripture that they knew, the Scripture fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Let me offer a practical example of this. Let's look to the Nicene Creed. In the year 325, the first of the great councils of the church met in Nicaea, in modern-day Turkey, as a gathering of all the bishops to respond to a heresy that threatened Christian unity. The heresy was known as Arianism, which taught that Jesus Christ was not the same being, the same substance, as God the Father. That is, Christ himself was a created being, they said. And there was a time when Christ did not exist, they said. It was not the weight of the words of Holy Scripture that alone settled the issue that challenged the very nature of Jesus Christ and his relationship to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Instead, what happened? The bishops of the early church, as successors of the apostles, met together to discern the truth, to forge a consensus that would ultimately become our Nicene Creed. Acting with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which empowered them from the time of Pentecost, and in accordance with the teaching they received as successors of the original apostles, the Council of Nicaea gave us a definitive formula of truth. Interestingly, mainline Protestants embrace the Nicene Creed and recognize its authoritative statement of the faith. It's significant to note that while the books we now know as the New Testament were in circulation at the time and being shared with the faithful, the canon of Holy Scripture was not officially delineated and closed until some 70 years after the Council of Nicaea. It is an important historical reality that the creed existed before a formal definition of what we know today as the Bible. How is it then possible that Holy Scripture alone can be what Christ intended as the sole authority for his church? The Bible itself was defined by the apostolic successors acting with an authority that clearly predated the formal New Testament. It is this earliest model of authority that continues to drive the Catholic Church today. It is the reason we place equal emphasis on the sacred tradition of the Church and sacred Scripture. Early in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, at paragraph 80, we read the following. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other, for both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together to form one thing and moves towards the same goal. Each of them makes present and fruitful in the church the mystery of Christ, who promised to remain with his own always to the close of the age. Echoing the words of the earliest fathers and doctors of the church, the catechism goes on to explain that sacred tradition and sacred scripture share the same divine source, but are two different modes of transmitting the one universal truth. This is what it says. Sacred tradition is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. It transmits to the successors of the apostles so that, enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their teaching. Therefore, the church that Christ himself founded, to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation was entrusted, does not derive all certainty about truth from Holy Scripture alone. We acknowledge that both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored, as the Catechism notes, with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. This speaks to a living tradition within the church from the time Christ established it. Indeed, the New Testament itself is proof, a demonstration of that living tradition at work. The authority that secured sacred scripture for Christians was not sola scriptura. This is a theological and historical impossibility.
In an interesting irony of history, Martin Luther tried to remove several books from the canon of Holy Scripture in the printing of his 1534 German translation of the Bible. In the end, he placed the historical books of Hebrews and James, along with the letters of St. John and Revelation of St. John, in an appendix out of their traditional and canonical order of nearly 1,200 years. By what authority was Luther's reordering of Holy Scripture done? The Protestants shift away from the teaching authority Christ gave to his apostles and successors has produced fruits of division and separation, with Christians distanced from each other. True unity, as expressed in the seamless garment of Christ's own crucifixion, cannot exist apart from the life-giving sacramental grace flowing from the authority of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Next week, this podcast will examine the Catholic Reformation as we see it in and through the Council of Trent, which I referred to earlier in this episode, the Council of Trent, which began in 1545, which we see as the true Reformation, the one which purified and strengthened the church, a council that prayed for and sought a restoration of unity. We conclude in prayer, as we have done with the other episodes, using one of the beautiful prayers we pray at Masses for the church and for Christian unity. This one makes reference to the Word, and so we pray. In this your church, O Lord, may integrity of faith, holiness of life, fraternal charity, and pure religion flourish and abide until the end. And as you do not fail to feed her with the body of your Son and with your word, so also never cease, we pray, to guide her under your protection. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Until next week, thanks for listening to the Catholic Retrospective Podcast. Mm